Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Thank you so very much. The floor is yours. So thank you to the whole group for asking me to come share my experience, strength, and hope. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay, perfect. So the topic is emotional sobriety. And I have a lot to say about this particular topic because I believe that most, if not all, real alcoholics were actually restless, irritable, and discontent before they took the first drink. And so what does that mean for me? You know, they say things like, it's a family disease. Um, It's hereditary. And I look at that stuff and they still haven't found the gene for alcoholism. I don't believe they're ever going to find the gene for alcoholism because I believe that when they say it's hereditary, when they say it's a family disease, they're talking about the environment and behavior that is mimicked and passed down and imprinted from grandma to mommy to baby to grandbaby, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And most of the time, these behaviors are subconscious. You know, very few people had access or still have access to a really good therapist that's going to take you into childhood trauma and show you, like Bill Wilson says in the 12 and 12, the patterns that have discolored the, 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 the tapestry that has discolored the patterns of your life. And so I look at that and I can see that my own mother is a war survivor. That alone from Germany is very, very, very severe. She starved, bombs went off. They were in bomb shelters. Her father had to go to war. There was no food. I mean, my mom was hungry her whole childhood. And so often people think about the Germans and they think, was your mother a Nazi? No, she wasn't a Nazi. They were German peasants in the mountains. They didn't know that people were being exterminated. They didn't know anything anything about anything. My mother was very naive and grew up in a really fearful, scarce environment. If you didn't eat your food and if you didn't eat everything on your plate, what would happen is you would get slapped and you would get hit. And the reason being is because, oh gosh, can you close the door? I'm so sorry. sorry. Um, the, it, the reason being is because she had such a tremendous amount of fear coming from her own childhood starvation, et cetera. Go ahead and close the door. Thanks, Chance. Uh, starvation, et cetera. Don't waste food. Don't waste food became this horrible, almost violent or violent punishing thing. I remember sitting at the table for hours. Sometimes I had to finish my food. She would lock me in the bathroom with a plate. And I'm telling you the reason why I'm giving you these scenarios is because I had to find out and dig deep and go down into the basement and see where I first started this behavior. How did I get the wiring that I got? So many people walk into the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous and the sponsor asks them, what happened when you took the first drink? You know what? There's, it's not compartmentalized. I, I can't chop my life up into tiny little pieces and pretend that in vitro and the first seven years have nothing to do with my teen years, have nothing to do with my 20s, have nothing to do with alcohol, cocaine, sniffing, snorting, eating, whatever, pick your poison. So my mom did the best she could. This is also not to blame our parents, but I'm telling you, it's really important that we see where the wounds first came from, where the wiring came from. So in a way, we have to turn on our parents or the primary caregivers temporarily so that we can really take a deep look at ourselves. Once we see what's wrong, then we have something to come to believe that a power can restore and make a decision to turn this defect, I'll call it, towards God instead of Repeating the terrible cycle, whether it's rage or hatred or, you know, I don't even know, eating chocolate cake, stealing, lying, sex. I mean, the disease manifests, it says, uh, driven by a hundred forms of fear, self-delusion, self-seeking. And the hundred forms of fear often will create a defect where I need to go into a behavior that will temporarily check me out of the present moment because I can't handle life on life's terms. Alcoholics have 
no capacity to self-soothe. And if the shoe fits, wear it. Every once in a while, I get somebody that hears this style of message and it doesn't ring true for them. They claim that they had a perfectly happy childhood, that everybody got along, that their parents allowed them to process their pain and their feelings, that somebody nurtured them, that birthdays and Christmases meant something, that bedtime was a beautiful ritual, that nobody was ever disciplined at the dinner table, that there was never spanking or raging or drinking or yelling. And I believe that for the most part, those people are incredibly rare, 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 rare. So I look at my own childhood. There are three daughters. I'm in the middle. And so psychiatrically or psychologically, if you look at that, I'm the classic scapegoat. The youngest child is the golden child. And my older sister is the invisible child. And you can find this information anywhere. It's just a, a basic pattern of the three children. And sometimes you can shuffle the deaf and the invisible one is the third one and the golden child is the second one and so on and so forth. But my mother had this very strange capacity to pit her children against one another. She's a classic narcissist. She cannot say she's sorry. She cannot apologize to people. She doesn't know how to tell her children that she loves them. There's a lot going on there. And I feel that a lot of this has to do with her Germanic background. Uh, she was beaten so severely by her father that she had to lie or she had to pretend it didn't happen or she had to say, I didn't do it. That wasn't me. Because if she did, she'd get hit. So I see where her defect of narcissism, the wiring comes in. The child had to bullshit. She had to compartmentalize. She had to conceal her true feelings and not be in touch with them because she would get beaten and spanked. There was a lot at stake there. So then she brings this parenting into the world and she has these children and my mother's addicted to drama and she makes her children addicted to drama also. She pits the children against each other. She tells their secrets. She'll invite two of them and leave out one and then say, don't tell. She says, don't tell this, don't tell that. She'll tell one not to tell, and then that one will tell the other ones. She'll give someone a special present and not give it to the other two. Um, you know, just your worst secrets. I mean, I just remember having so much trouble, you know. I know this is an AA meeting, so I don't want to water it down with heroin, but I remember when I, when I started using heroin and I couldn't get off, and my mom would, like, introduce me to her friends and go, and this one's my heroin addict, you know, but this is the one that's shooting heroin, and I'd be like, wow, just straight up public humiliation and shame. So what does that do to the child? What that does is several different ways that it can go. One of them is my older sister, who's the invisible child. She just stuffed her feelings and stuffed her feelings. She became very quiet. She read in her room. She tried not to make any waves. She didn't want to get in an argument. She barely stood up for herself. She just hid from the war. And she is a classic alcoholic still in her cups and wet. And how it has manifested is she can't remember any of it. Her whole childhood has vanished. And if she can remember, the scenarios bear no resemblance to how I remembered it. So we view things from a completely different point. And so the outcome or the story of what happened is completely different, yet we were in the same household. Then you have me, the middle child, and the younger child. The younger child would always be uh, the golden child and be my mother's favorite. So no matter what kind of shit went down, I was the one that was going to get hit and beat. And I got slapped and hit and beat by my mother and father over and over and over. And then how this manifested for me was I became the attention seeker, the wild, noisy, good fellow, like they say in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, the attention seeker, restless, irritable, and discontent, defiance and grandiosity are the outstanding characteristic of every alcoholic. Um, Harry Tebow talks about the queen and the baby, you know, I have no capacity to, to properly digest and, and, and form healthy opinions and process what's going on. I, I'm a baby and I throw a fit when I don't get my way and then off with your head, the queen says, and I 
write people out of my life. I delete you. I avoid you. I throw people away. I turn on you like a rattlesnake. And I started this behavior at a very young age. Why is this important? Because I need to see who I brought to Alcoholics Anonymous. It has nothing to do with the day I poured the first drink. Alcohol actually was the solution, liquid solution, emotional solution, spiritual solution for a very long time. The only thing that's bigger than all of that is a power greater than self, which I choose to call God. And God was nowhere to be found in prayer and meditation. I had no idea. I had no coping skills. So now this child is being hit and slapped and screamed and yelled at. And she's seeking, attention seeking, negative behavior. She's wild. She's unruly. I know how to flip my parents off. I started cussing at a really early age. You could see there was actually even a shift in my behavior. Like I'd get really loud and I'd get aggressive and fuck you and I'd get all street and crazy as it got older. I would wear uh, angry faces and hats. I had personality shifts because these were tools that I built inside of my character in order to navigate through the landmines of my primary environment, which was my mother and my father and these two other sisters. So I'd get really loud or I'd get really crazy. I learned how to really bully my sisters. In the end, I learned how to bully my mother. I would hit my mother. I would slap my mother. I would get in my father's face. He would hit me. We would knock each other out. You know, and then it started somewhere around 11 or 12. Me and my dad are boxing each other out. And then what happens? What happens when the daddy hits the baby girl? Well, it can manifest in very many ways. But for me, the way it manifested, as I grow older, I'm attracted to the guy that knocks women out. And I walk into a room and at a subconscious level, I'm going to find the guy with the restraining order and I'm in love. I see him all the way across the room. There he is. And I don't know what it is, but my snake and my honing device goes beep, 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 beep. I'm attracted. And you know, like the book so eloquently says, we are the breeder of confusion, not harmony. I don't know how to meet calamity with serenity. I meet calamity with calamity. And this is the pattern that has discolored my life forever. It didn't start one day this whole thing started. It, it didn't go like that. It's been there almost forever and ever and ever. So, you know, as time goes on and I grow up, these primary immature behaviors turn into huge defects that are rooted themselves into the core of my soul, of my personality, of my behavior. And they just don't look very pretty when you're 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years old out in public. Um, the 12 and 12 says, I have the total inability to form a true partnership with another human being. I don't know how to say I'm sorry. I don't know how to see my part in it. I don't know how to back down. I don't know how to have compassion for you when you've hurt my feelings. I hate you. I hate all of you. I hate everybody and I don't trust you. And I don't know this. I don't know that this is part of my wiring. If you had asked me when I was untreated in my dis-ease, I would have said, yeah, I love people, sure. But if I really had to get down to the causes and conditions and the underpinning of my untreated alcoholism, I would realize that it pretty much ran on two emotions, fear and anger, which are actually almost two sides of the same coin. And I was constantly in fear that I'm going to get taken advantage of, that somebody's going to win the fight, that I'm not going to be seen, that I'm not going to be heard. And this manifests its way in so many manipulative tactics. I don't even know it. I don't even know that this is how I got wired. So at some point, I'm so restless, irritable, and discontent. By the way, I believe that early childhood trauma and insomnia go hand in hand. It's classic psychiatric diagnostic when you see a child that literally can't sleep. Every single noise is starting to drive them crazy. I think the sink is dripping. I hear the clock. I can't deal. There's a dog three quarters of the street down, you know, barking, barking. And I could see that I was growing neurotic. And as Harry Tebow in the Tebow paper says, every alcoholic is neurotic, but not every neurotic is an alcoholic. I mean, like, just spin that one in your head for a little while. So the neuroses were there before the drink. 
And then somewhere around 12 or 13, I mean, I'm just a mess. I'm honestly, if you looked at me, you could see it's all coming. It's all coming. This one, she's going to go and she's going to go hard. You just know it. If you know what to look for, you can see that it all there in the making. Just pour some liquor on it and kapoof. <laughs> I don't have defects of character. I'm a defective character. Just pour liquor on me and it's like pouring miracle grow. Kaboom, it's going to come out. So I go to a party like so many people here and somebody hands me a beer and I pop open a Budweiser and I drink that first beer and alcohol does for me what I cannot do for myself. Wow, I'm not socially awkward. People aren't tripping me out. He's cute, I like you, this is really fun. And I have a big personality shift. I back down and I feel good. I love this beer. Oh my God, what sign are you? Oh, I live down there too. I went to that elementary school and I open up my heart chakra opens, everything opens and I can't believe that I feel so different. I have a real Dr. Jekyll and Mrs. Hyde shift and it's really so beautiful. I mean, the clouds part and the angels trumpet and I'm feeling good and I go home and I like it. Even if I barfed or even if I got a stomach ache, it was so fun. We partied all night till three in the morning. I met so many cool people and we just laughed and had such a good time. And I had not crossed over the invisible line yet. Do I believe that children are born with the phenomenon of craving? Well, it's it's a topic to definitely discuss at length, but for me, no. And for most alcoholics that I ask, they say no. There are very few people that I think are born with the phenomenon of craving. And I'll tell you why. We can see other cultures all over the world that offer their children a small amount of wine or some type of liqueur. And the child then doesn't go into the liquor cabinet and drink the whole bottle of wine and go tricycling down the street at three in the morning, smashing into people's garbage cans, etc. So I look back at it and I remember still wanting a good life. I, I wanted to be a good person. I wanted to go to high school and college and I wanted to have a career and I had these dreams and ideas of the white picket fence or the geodesic dome, or I was gonna raise pygmy goats and I was gonna breastfeed forever and grow a bunch of tomatoes and have a good time, you know? And I meant well, but I couldn't do well. So eventually at some point I drink and I drink and I drink and I lose the freedom of choice. Alcohol now becomes my master, I cross over, an invisible line. Where is this invisible line? I don't know. They call it an invisible line because it's an invisible line. I think somewhere around 10th grade, I crossed over the invisible line and I was drinking every night. And like, I don't even know where my parents were. And again, this isn't to blame them, but I'm like, I'm like 15 years old and I'm dating like 25 year old guys. I'm using fake IDs. I'm going into bars. I'm smoking pot all night. I'm taking LSD. I'm taking crossroad whites. I'm, I'm 61 years old. So the seventies were just like on and cracking in California. I mean, we were just wild and woolly driving around in the back of some guy's pickup truck with, you know, no seatbelts, no anything, just, ay, ay, ay. you know, and in those days, the boogeyman wasn't out there. There wasn't a bunch of date rape and insanity like you'd go home with a with a one night stand and he'd actually like take you to breakfast the next morning and buy you pancakes and kiss you goodbye I mean it wasn't spooky there was a lot of fun going on but alcohol is a classic depressive and I started to go into this pattern where I would drink at night. I would wake up in the morning and literally want to blow my brains out. I couldn't deal. And I would have these stories of shame because I was the Dr. Jekyll and the Mrs. Hyde. I would just be so embarrassed about what I said and what I did. Pitiful and incomprehensible demoralization. I would just lay there and die in bed. And I would swear that I'm never going to do this again. And I meant well, but I couldn't do well. I swear, I swear, I swear I'm not doing this again. And somewhere around six o'clock, I changed my mind. I don't change my mind. 
the disease of untreated alcoholism changes my mind for me. An obsession is stronger than self-will. Let me say it again. The obsession of the mind is so much stronger than self-will. That's why we look like liars and we really mean well, but we can't do well because there's only one thing that's more powerful than the obsession of the mind. And that's a power greater than self. But like I said before, this power is nowhere near so every night here I go again and then every day depressed and I can see looking back I can see my brain chemistry just getting more and more skewed the dopamine the serotonin the norepinephrine all of those feel-good hormones you know once you drink 365 days out of the year you've skewed your brain chemistry and then add the drugs from the 70s and the 80s and even the drugs today and you know just the, the the mind gets so bent and the emotions get so bent and then the liver and the kidney and everything else just gets so bent out of shape that we really go from bad to worse. The alcoholic never gets better. He always gets worse. So I start going to bars and just hanging out with naughty, wild people and drugs and motorcycles and playing pool all night long and cussing people out and just being an aggressive asshole because I didn't know any better at that point. That's all I really had was that type of insanity. And I had healthy shame and I had healthy guilt. It's interesting. The average alcoholic is not psychopathic or sociopathic. Sociopaths are in a very different league by themselves. Most of them are not alcoholics. They're incredibly calculated. One of the top three um, characteristics of a sociopath is they are very charming. Hello, Mrs. Cleaver. I love your pearls. You look so lovely today. That wasn't us. We were like ripping and running and getting into people's faces and getting into a bunch of trouble. And our hearts we're very tender and our feelings would get hurt really easily and we couldn't handle rejection well. And I want to talk about that for a minute because the primary ecosystem was so rejective with my mother and father. I was constantly rejected. There was no love that my skin for rejection is very, very, very thin. You see a child that's properly nurtured and heard by their parents and you're going to see that this child can totally handle when they're not invited to someone's party. Well, let me tell you at 61, my untreated alcoholism says I better be invited to your party. I really don't want to go, but I better be invited. I actually hate your guts, but you better invite me. And I look at this and it just, it bears no resemblance to any type of reality. So anyway, let me watch what I'm doing here because I know I only have, okay, there we went like 30 minutes into the problem. Let's get into some solution here. So I'm restless and I'm irritable and I'm discontent, you know, it. and I take this thing out into the world and it doesn't do well. I'm hungover. I'm angry. I'm irritated. I'm so argumentative. I need to be right even when I'm wrong. And I will hold on like a dog chewing on a bone till the end. And I will dismiss you and I will throw you away and I will talk shit about you. And I will tell your secrets just like I learned in my family. I learned this from my mother mother and my sisters. This is not to blame them it's to show you that this is to show you that this is where I came from. Like these are the defects that I'm now going to have to offer to God. I'm going to have to inventory and see my part. And I'm not all that clever. Honestly, the behavior pretty much injects itself into every single relationship I've ever had. So I go out into the world and I drink till the wheels fall off. And like most of us alcoholics, there's a trap door and another trap door and another trap door. And um, the first time I got sober, I was like I'm 61 now. I was 27 years old and I went to a rehab for a month. And then I came out and I did 90 meetings in 90 days and I got a sponsor and I did what they told me, get a commitment. And I cleaned up ashtray, ashtrays you could smoke in those days. And I remember them saying stuff like stick with the winners. I don't even know what a winner is. I would think that the girl with the Mercedes and the really big boobs and long fingernails that had money or married some guy, you know, with a bunch of money, she's a winner. She's got stuff on the outside. I don't even know what I don't even know. I'm so out there. And I go through the steps to the best of my ability. And I really am not having a true psychic change where God becomes the master or I turn my will and my life and my thought 
life over to the care of this power as I understood him in step two and then step three and then 11, seeking through prayer and meditation to continuously improve my conscious contact with this God. I personally don't think I heard the true message of AA. I feel like AA is beautiful, but this message is getting watered down and people spend an awful lot of time talking about what it was like, what it was like, what it was like, and their life still looks like what it was like. Or the last five minutes they go, now it's great. And I've got a husband or a wife and some dogs and I'm actually raising the pygmy goats. And I did build a geodesic dome. Yay. And it's like, wait a minute, Turbo, hold on. Like, how are you treating your fellows? Do you have true forgiveness in your heart? Can you step up and be of maximum service to other people without any kind of thank you can you be there for your parents the ones that carve this defective character and can you walk into their environment without getting triggered i mean these are really big questions the steps are not a homework assignment they're not they're a plan for living it's a spiritual kit of tools laid at my feet and their aa is a group of principles they're spiritual in their nature which if practiced not memorized like homework if practiced as a way of life will expel the obsession to drink or think and enable the sufferer to become happily and usefully whole so one of the big bullet points of this program is i want to be happy happily and usefully whole and if i'm not i'm doing something wrong so i get sober and i do this thing to the best of my ability and I get pregnant early 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 on into that first sobriety and I think if I have a baby everything will be fine you know I know what I'm gonna do I'm gonna be a mother so I become a single parent I put myself through college I move from Massachusetts to California I put my daughter in a Waldorf school I do the Waldorf teacher training and I'm restless irritable and discontent and I wake up every morning in untreated alcoholism without the drink See, I never realized that the main part of the illness actually centers in the alcoholic's mind rather than her body. And if I don't have a psychic change, I will be the same woman drunk as I am sober. Let me say that one more time. I will be the same woman drunk as I am sober. I was always restless, irritable, and discontent. Alcohol worked as a solution for a long time. It was medication that actually stopped me from killing myself. It really did. It saved my life in the beginning. Alcohol saved me, saved me from not blowing my brains out or jumping off a cliff or slitting my wrists. And eventually it stopped working and it blew things up even worse. And now there I stand, stark raving sober with no feathers, a bird that's just fallen out of a nest and the lights are too bright and I can't handle life on life's terms and everything triggers me. So I try to get all this outside stuff, never realizing the calls are coming from inside the house. It's an inside job. I don't realize that. I don't know what I don't know. I don't know I'm the self-manufacturer of my own misery. You guys are doing it. The planet is doing it. You know, Monsanto is doing it. Donald Trump is doing it. The drug companies are doing it. Ralph's Market is doing it. Society is doing it. They're all doing it. I have no capacity for acceptance and acceptance really is the answer to all of my problems. And to this day, Peace is my most valuable asset. And we are talking about emotional sobriety. And that's what I want more than anything. So putting the plug in the jug is only one tiny step towards really being happily and usefully whole. We will be amazed before we're halfway through. Constantly remind myself I'm no longer running the show. So I must look at the self that we talk about in here. You see, when I walk in, the old character is this big and the new character is this big. And hopefully as I apply spiritual principles and grow a relationship with God, the new character eventually gets this big and the old character shrinks down. So there's a lot of work to be done and there's no finishing line. There's always a lot of work to be done. This is no joke because there's always continuous affairs to practice principles in every day, whether it's traffic or your boss or whoever's on the phone or whatever the news is saying, or God forbid the pandemic, you forgot your mask. I don't know who should I get a shot or shouldn't I? There's always affairs to practice the principles and there's no finishing line. She doesn't have it. He's got it. They're doing it. 
It's a daily and a moment by moment reprieve contingent on the maintenance of my spiritual condition. So what do I do? I do it to the best of my ability and I fall short big time. And eventually 10 years of sobriety and I fall short and I wind up in round two and I go down fast and hard. And that second relapse, my daughter moves in with some other people. She's, you know, whatever, 11 years old you know, and I move into the street and I know this is an AA meeting, but I start drinking and smoking crack and going in and out of jail and in and out of jail. And I stay out in the street for three years. I have a 18 drug and alcohol related cases and 23 prostitution cases. And I mean, I destroyed my brain chemistry and I destroyed my health and I destroyed my self-esteem, which was never good anyway, because it was always squashed. So I start going to rehab after rehab eventually you know the police are just rounding me up and threatening to put me in prison even though it's just a misdemeanor to be out in the street drunk in public possession of an open container whatever you know and uh i go to another rehab and finally somebody hands me these tapes by this guy named bob anderson and my life begins to change and my home group we're called primetime we have a website primetime is now.com i am not trying to sell anything here everything in aa is for fun and for free i personally this is my one hour so i'm going to share from my experience strength and hope i'm not into the whole my lineage my lineage my lineage my babies my pigeons my girls there's one ultimate authority and it's a loving God. May you find him now. And I need help. I need human help, but I don't want to rely on human help. In the beginning, I needed so much human help. I needed to run stuff by a human being all the time because the answers couldn't come because my internal house wasn't in order because I didn't have what we call emotional sobriety. I didn't have it yet. But eventually, when we download and we calm down and we get centered in the present moment, we have emotional sobriety and we can intuitively know how to handle situations that used to baffle us. So we walk in and we see that we're so full of self that we're selfing all over the place. There's these prayers and these sentences. They say, God, I offer myself to thee. Build with me. Do with me as thou will. Relieve me of the bondage of self. Uh, selfishness and self-centeredness we think is the root of our trouble driven by a hundred forms of fear self-delusion self-seeking you know made a decision to turn my will and my life over to the care of god as i understood him so anyway or come to believe that a power greater than self so what is the self what is this crazy self this self is the one that walked into aa this self that's addicted to her thought life addicted to her opinions addicted to her desires all woven in with the three primary instinct my instinct for sex my instinct for security and my instinct for approval and anytime i have an obsessive thought i can always attach it to one of those three primary instincts the mouse in the house is not that hard to find and if the main part of the illness centers in the alcoholic's mind well, what part of her mind? It's my subconscious mind. It's down in here. It's not up in here. The conscious mind is this big and the subconscious mind might even be as big as the universe. It might be. It's gigantic. But I have a BB brain and I trained myself to use my intuition for security. And I'm always in fight or flight. I'm always looking around. I'm always trying to see like, am I safe? Am I not safe? Is everything okay? And I need to get way past that type of behavior. I need to get way past uh, always being in fight or flight, always being in a, in, a, in a protective mode where I really can't even expand or I don't know how to rest or I don't know how to relax or I don't know how to allow things to just be or be in a state of acceptance. I don't know that. And my mind speaks to me with great authority. So I get these tapes by this guy, Bob Anderson, and I start listening to these tapes like my life depends on it. And I start to hear this guy say the main part of the illness centers in the uh, alcoholic's subconscious mind that the disease is hidden down in where 
all of my yesterdays are, all of my warped instincts warped, you know, they, it, in the 12 and 12, he says that, that these instincts far exceed their intended purpose. They wildly, blindly drive me. I need your attention, but I hate you. I need a lot of money. I don't know how much. I might even need so much money that I think I need to steal from people or I need to lie. Or if the bank teller or someone at the store gives me $20 too much, I think... I need this and I'm not giving it back. You see, I don't even know what I don't even know because I'm just wired for it. So what I was taught to do was begin to watch the thoughts that surf the waves of my brain. What are the ideas that come up from the subconscious mind to the conscious mind? Well, if I'm in survival mode, I'm in fight or flight all the time. I'm going to be jumpy and jittery. Let me say one thing real quick about fight or flight. I don't necessarily believe that ADD and ADHD really exist. And I know somebody on here is going to jump all over me. I believe that these children with these attention deficit disorders like me come from chaos. They come from pain and they're so jumpy and they're so nervous that post-traumatic stress looks exactly like ADHD. And I know somebody on here is going to shoot me with this one, but I believe because I was that child, I was restless, irritable, and discontent. What's going on? Are we safe? What's our environment like? Does the teacher see us? Can I deal? And I could see that I was so jumpy. I was all over the place that, can I just say this? I honestly feel that my IQ was so high and it wasn't nurtured. It was squashed. And I just thought, I'm so dumb. I'm so stupid. I'm so scared. I'm so ugly. I'm so, I had every single name in the book for myself. I didn't know what I didn't know because none of that was nurtured at all. So who did I bring to Alcoholics Anonymous? A very damaged, broken (laughs) five-year-old in a 40-year-old body, (laughs) you know? So I come into AA and I hear Bob Anderson, you know, talk about the main part of the illness centering in the alcoholic's mind rather than her body. And it's a subconscious disease and the disease is woven into my ego and my instinct for security, sex and approval. And this is what I choose to call untreated alcoholism. I do not have the capacity to self-soothe. I can't back down. When you ask me to be still, I don't know how to be still. When we go out to dinner, I'm so nervous. I feel like I continuously need to inject sentences and make something up to talk about. If we're on a road trip, I feel like I have to just fill in the dead airspace. I didn't know how to just sit next to somebody for even two or three hours and not say anything or just listen to whatever the person had to say to me and not rebuttal with some type of opinion or try to speak over them or get ready for Freddie and think about what am I going to say next? When's my turn and interrupt somebody because my ideas are more important. We must be rid of the selfishness and self-centeredness. We must be rid of the self or it kills us. God, I offer the self to thee, please, man, power. You got to help me. So as I start to build an awareness of what my mind is doing, you see, the disease is naturally designed not to see itself. It's not going to say, Astrid, you're in the disease. The disease is always off and running. And I don't believe that disease wants to kill me. The disease is a vampire. It's a parasite. It's a spiritual parasite and a spiritual vampire, and it needs a host to host a party. And it attaches itself to my neurons, to my thoughts, to my subconscious mind, to my past, to my future, to my resentments, to anything. It'll use any material in order to keep itself alive. And it just wants to make me vibrate at a very low frequency. It doesn't like the sunlight of the spirit. It doesn't want to grow spiritually. It wants me to rest on my laurels. It wants me to hate. It wants me to be in fear. It wants me to be in confusion. It wants to gaslight me. It wants me to go back into my same behaviors over and over and over again and pick Mr. Loser or show up late continuously or, you know, eat way too much sugar than I ever needed to or whatever your defects are to stay away from the present moment. So I look at the first and the half, second half of step one. 
First half of step one, I'm powerless over alcohol. Everybody on this feed is powerless over alcohol or y'all wouldn't be here today. It's the only part of the steps that I can do perfectly. I am absolutely 100% powerless over alcohol. I believe because I crossed over the invisible line that I will never, ever, ever be able to drink with any kind of satisfaction. You know, I will never be able to uh, go back and not have the allergic reaction. I believe whatever the mechanism was or is with the pancreas and with blood sugar and with the phenomenon of craving, I broke it. It's broken. It's physically broken and it's damaged. And it's the only part of the steps that I can do perfectly. I got to put the plug in the jug. Now we have this dash that my life is unmanageable and we have 11 and a half steps we really need to look at. So dash that my life is unmanageable, what part of my life? Well, if every bit of behavior starts with a thought, then it's my thought life that's unmanageable. I used to think, you know, it was the jails, it was the handcuffs, it was the burnt holes with the cigarette and the couch, it was the lying to my boyfriend, it was the time management issues, it was my anger and my hostility, et cetera. No, 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 no. It's literally my thought life. My thought life is unmanageable and I need to take an honest appraisal of what my mind is doing on a moment by moment basis. So I was taught to look at the thoughts that surf the waves of my brain and to even write down the most repetitive thoughts. Neuroscientists will tell you that the average human being has 46,000 thoughts a day the average alcoholic has four thoughts that go 46,000 times a day. And I may not be much, but I'm all I think about. And the selfishness and self-centeredness truly is the root, the root of my trouble. So I start to look at my thoughts and I have this homework assignment that I give people all the time. And I just say, hey, write down your most repetitive thoughts. And when they do, I can tell you the number one universal thought in the entire world. Here it is. Ready? You think you're so smart. The number one universal thought is I'm not going to make it. I don't know where the hell we're all making it to, but we're not going to make it. We're not going to make it with the money. We're not going to make it with the approval. We're not going to make it with the job. I'm just not going to make it, you know, and. God will constantly disclose more to us. You know what? I got to stay with this power because I have no business future surfing one foot in tomorrow, one foot in yesterday, and I'm peeing all over today. And truly, you know, my grand sponsor, Bob A from primetime would say the, I have no business being in the resentments of the past or the fear of the future, unless I'm in an inventory process, that the only time I can treat my dis-ease is in the present moment. So I need to become very awake to the thoughts that are surfing the waves of my brain, very, very, very conscious and not allow them to run amok and to go from the subconscious mind to the conscious mind and to create ungrounded, unfounded fear or make me act from a defective character, make me harm and hurt people. And in the beginning, I would say the first two years were were really rough. You know, I would wake up in the morning and I would look at the first thoughts that surfed the waves of my brain. I could just see, man, I was in a panic. You know, I was finally out of jail. I hadn't seen my daughter in three years. I'm out in the desert and in the middle of nowhere, you know, just trying to get sober. And I feel so much shame and so much pain about my daughter. I mean, I bonded with her. I breastfed for three years. I loved her so much. How could I have done this? Her mom's a street whore. I mean, it's just so painful. But I remembered what Bob A would say. He'd say, I have no business being in the past. So I just say, that's not me right now. That's not me. I'm a woman in recovery. I'm a woman of God. It's the only safety square there. Were, I had blown my life up, you guys. And I mean, really, my German mom, she already hated her kids. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? what she'd want to say to me. Like I literally didn't even have Christmas or Easter or any, 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 uh, uh, time with her, any, um, holidays with my family for at least the first five years of my physical sobriety. I was so thin skinned and I needed so much help. By the way, I still need so much help. I need people in my life that I run stuff by. I don't use one specific sponsor. I have four or five people that I would call spiritual advisors and I run myself and my problems by my little committee. And, uh, and that's what I do. You know what? The book is meant to be suggestive only. I had this woman a couple of months ago say, 
I just can't believe you don't have a sponsor. I don't know how anyone couldn't have a sponsor. You know, that's such judgment there. Like I stay so close to this message and so close to God and so close to this program. You know what? There's one ultimate authority and it is a loving God. May you find this God now and God speaks through people. And I just personally don't go to one particular person over and over. I've sponsor hopped and I've used so much spiritual literature and I've done everything I can. I need to make sure I'm not blowing the time here. I've done everything I can to stay with this power and to continue to grow along spiritual lines. So in the beginning, I start to ask this power, power, can you protect me from my mind power? Can you help me? Can you just help me? I have so much shame and I have so much guilt. How am I ever going to get my daughter back? How am I going to get a job? What am I going to do? I hate my life. I hate myself. I'm so full of shame. And I would ask with intention. I would pray to this power with my heart mind, like Emmett Fox says in the Sermon on the Mount. I would pray in the secret place. Everybody here has a secret internal spiritual telephone booth wired for God. All you need to do is go down in there and just say power. And you ask with your heart, power, I'm begging you, please. You've got to lift this merciless obsession for whatever. I'm so ashamed. I may not be much, but I'm all I think about. I don't know how to function. I don't know how to live in this world. And when I pray with intention, great events will come to pass for you and countless others. This is the great fact abandon this self completely and I would start to have these moments of just unbelievable reprieve where I would just think I'm experiencing the grace of God God loves me and I would have these moments where I would think wow there's no thoughts coming or going how is this possible my mind is so quiet And I would get empirical evidence in step two, asking this power to please be the manager for my life, coming to believe that a power can restore me way down in step two, not in the amends, not in the inventory, not in anywhere, down in this foundation of one, two, and three. I would start to get empirical evidence. God would start to back me down and give me real evidence that there's a power that I choose to call God and this God can bestow grace upon me. The peace that passes all understanding. I would have an open mind and an open heart. And it says the answers come when you own, when your own house is in order. Most of the time the answers are, I don't know. And I don't need to know. I don't need to know anything. I just need to back down and try to shut the thoughts off that surf the waves of my brain. The ego doesn't like this method at all because the ego wants to be large and in charge. The ego is used to having the car keys and the steering wheel. And when we're talking about emotional sobriety, the ego is absolutely addicted to the drama. I can see it in my own family. You know, my mom, she's 87 years old. She's out in the other room. That was my daughter that brought her dog in for a minute. We're all good, but my mom's still, she's still a narcissist and she still just loves to like poke the stick at the children. And there's no way I'm going to tell you guys that I'm a saint. I'm willing to grow along spiritual lines, but man, oh man, I don't do this thing perfectly. But you know what? I do it so much better than ever before. I would say nine times out of 10, I don't take the bait and I back down. But every once in a while, guess who she gets? Yup. She gets that lunatic in the basement, the self that I chained up with a with a tiny little, you know, whatever, six inch chain. She gets no kibble, no water, no anything. I just keep her down in there and I don't let her get out and I don't let her run the show. And I'm not addicted to my opinions and I'm not addicted to my anger and I don't lead with my wound and I don't need to be right. And you don't need to like me and you don't need to love me and you don't even need to approve of me. You know what? I don't say this from a nasty place. I want you to hear me. I'm not here for your approval. I'm here for me. I'm here in this hospital called Alcoholics Anonymous because my life came, became important to me. I have to keep the oxygen mask on myself 
I need to breathe the spiritual fumes that I found in two and three and seeking through prayer and meditation to improve my conscious contact with this power. I need to stay so close to this message. So close. So, 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 so close. I can't seek your approval. I don't care. I'm not interested whether you like me or you hate me or you don't. It's just going to hurt me if I go out and I look for that. I don't want to tap dance for anybody anymore. I don't. I know that God calls me in a very specific way. God calls me in Alcoholics Anonymous. God calls me to work with others. God calls me to transmit the message. God calls me <clears throat> to practice the principles in all of my affairs. And I pray all day long, all day long. And I ask God, please, please, anytime there's an obsessive thought, could you relieve me from this merciless obsession? At this point with 17 years, none of this is about drinking anymore. I, I honestly, as arrogant as this is going to sound, never say never. I just don't think I'm going to drink again. I just, what kind of problem is any liquor going to even, like, even if, I don't know, a nuclear bomb went off and I lost my daughter and I don't know, I was diagnosed with stage four cancer. How is vodka going to do anything for that? Like, I need to navigate I need to work with my feelings. I need to get God down there into a space where I can be emotionally sober, where I can handle the situations that used to baffle me, where I can live on God's terms without a big giant story in my life. I want peace. And like I said before, it is truly my most valuable asset and I will fight for it. You know, I'll tell you something else besides not being there for people's approval. There are very toxic people in case y'all haven't noticed. A lot of them are in the rooms of AA. <laughs> and you know what? God doesn't call me to work with everybody. Sometimes I have to delete them from my phone. I can't say hi. I can't be around you because you trigger my stuff. You know, it says practice the principles in all of your affairs. Sometimes you got to limit your affairs if you can't practice the principles in them. I couldn't even go into this house for the first five years of my sobriety. Beautiful Laguna Beach, German mother, the family's back together. And you know what? Let me tell you, my subconscious mind kicked and bucked and didn't want to come anywhere near this. And I had to limit the affairs because I could not practice the principles in all of those affairs. Couldn't. So I made it small and I don't feel that I'm mean or I'm nasty or I'm an a-hole. When I delete and block you and cut you out of my life, I can see toxicity coming. I am intuitively guided. I intuitively know how to handle situations. And I've been en around enough crazy here that sometimes I just have to say, no, 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 no. I can see people want to come at me with some kind of crazy argument or they just want to spew the drama du jour. They're addicted to their negativity and I can't do it, you guys. I just can't. I mean, I'm telling you, when they say the road gets narrow, it gets really narrow. If your peace is your most valuable asset, you're going to choose friendships of people that know how to treat their untreated alcoholism, that can stay in the present moment, that can be loving and can be accepting and can be forgiving and can be kind and compassionate and see somebody's side to things. Even if they say purple and I say green, it's okay, man, you can have purple. I'm cool with it. I don't need to jump into the arena and make somebody wrong and myself right and if I'm going to pick a bone and I'm going to get into the boxing ring, I'll tell you right now, this better be good. If, if I'm going to get on my spiritual muscle and I'm going to take a stand for something, it better be good. You know, the kind of things that I still take a stand for, I can only take a stand for my home group. The common welfare of prime time comes first. Somebody's 13 stepping or they're trying to get people in landmark forum to join their freaking whatever, or they're selling whatever it is, Avon, or I don't even care what. Don't come in here, not into my home group with that. Go to an Alano club, go some, somewhere else. And I'm going to call them out on it. I'm going to call the predator out on it. And I'm going to do it loud and clear. And I'm going to say your name all over the place and I'm going to shine a flashlight and I'm going to tell people stay away from her or stay away from him. This is a dangerous person because the common welfare of my group in my heart, in my big, big, 
big heart full of God, the common welfare of my group comes first. And sometimes I have to be outspoken. God calls me in this way. Maybe some of you, God doesn't call in that way. Oh, shut your cake hole. Oh, I wouldn't say anything. You know what? It's none of our business. I mean, some stuff is my business. I don't want to go over time. I think I, oh, I got like five more minutes, you know, and God calls me in that way. Maybe God doesn't call you in that way. I don't know. It doesn't matter, but you know, I know my calling because I can hear fourth dimensionally a special, special dog whistle. And God tells me in my heart, spiritually, move this way, go this way. You know, I've definitely, I'm at the forefront of primetime, my home group. I started the Thursday, the Friday, the Saturday, and then the Monday women's meeting. I don't take credit for that. God gave me the willingness. God called upon me for something specific. Self could have never done that. All those meetings, we talk about emotional sobriety, our website, our Facebook page. We're always trying to all back down, you know, brotherly and sisterly harmonious acts, action, you know, that really every day is the day I must carry the vision of God's will for me into all of my activities, not my will. You know what power yours be done. Please intuitively guide me through inspiration and enthusiasm. Show me what to do next. Be with me. Help me, God. Help me, help me, help me. Download in me. Me and you, God, mostly you. I'll just go along for the ride and you let me know second by second and moment by moment what to think and how to act. And most of the time, like I said, I don't know. And I don't need to know. I don't have all the answers. I don't need to have the answers. The answers come when your own house is in order. See it to it that your relationship with God is right. And 99% of the time, the answer is, I don't know. And I don't need to know. I just stay in my lane and I stay out of it. Anyway, I'm going to wrap it up because I think that we get like 30 minutes of questions and answers or sharing or stuff from the floor. And I want to hear everybody else's emotional sobriety. Thank you, group, for asking me to come share my experience, strength and hope. I love AA. I'm an AA woman. I love Bill and Bob and Lois and the whole damn gang. Come on, man. Let's get it on. (laughs) Thank you so much. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.